This morning we're going to be talking about uh, baptism, obviously, as you've seen from the video. There are a lot of different opinions about a lot of different things, and baptism is one of those. And probably about 90% of the things you believe about baptism are things that you maybe learned growing up or heard, and uh, you have adopted a belief system that may not be totally in scriptural alignment. So this morning I want to just invite you to take a step back and to think about what you believe about baptism and how that aligns with what the Bible teaches about baptism. It happens to all of us. I mean, I remember when I went to college the you know, first time, I was just out of home. I had just, uh, actually, I left home when I was about a week before I turned 18, so I was 17 years old when I left home, turned 18 my first week of college, and I remember getting exposed to some guys on my dormitory hallway that um, they believed that the, uh, they could read other versions of the Bible besides the King James, and that troubled me. Uh, I'd never heard of such a thing. I didn't know that people did such heathen things. And so uh, we had some spirited, spirited debates about it. Now, I would say that I don't remember that in the church I grew up in that they specifically taught there's only one Bible and it's the King James and that's all you could read. I don't remember hearing that, but it was pretty much all I'd ever been exposed to. And so I had adopted a belief system that the King James or you're going to hell, basically. Well, there were some other broader thinkers than me on that hallway there in Lanford dorm. Uh, I was in room 106, and uh, particularly there was a guy in room 105 that had uh, some different ideas, and I'm telling you, we went head-to-head -head a lot, and I even uh, had uh, got, uh, went to the trouble to go down to the Christian bookstore, and believe it or not, I found a track to support my position, and I took that track, and I gave it to him and said, how dare you do such a thing? I can't believe it, and you're, you call yourself a Christian. Here you are at this Christian university, and you're going into the ministry, and we went all, well, every time I see that guy, and that was 30 years ago right now that I met this guy, every time I see him, he still asks, you still reading the King James Version of the Bible? <laughs> and you can tell by that story, he's a very carnal man. Uh, you, you can just tell, can't you? But, uh, but what that does is it points to the fact, and, and we've all been there, where we have adopted a belief system that may not truly be scriptural. And uh, what I believed about the, the Bible translation, uh, really in a lot of ways, if I'm honest, it was based on ignorance. Because I probably hadn't even really been taught that that was the only version of the Bible, but it's all I knew at the time. And so I had some tunnel vision. And, uh, you know, as I went along and as I began to study and as I began to research and as I began to learn, I realized, you know, there's a lot of different translations. And, you know, here we read out of the NIV probably the most and the New Living Translation and the message and other paraphrases and translations. And uh, so I say to you that you may have a belief system about baptism that, that may not be 100% scripture. And so I'm just saying, hey, let's all be open today to what the Lord might have to say to us about this very important subject because he may have something to say to you. You may be say, oh, I haven't ever been baptized. He may want to speak to you about that today. Are you open? You may say, well, I was baptized as an infant, but I've never been baptized as an adult. He may want to speak to you today. Are you open to hear what he has to say? If you're here and you've uh, heard about baptism, probably a lar large part of what you believe may be what you've been taught, but maybe it's not biblical. In addition to that, if you grew up in an unchurched background, there's a good chance that uh, you don't even get it. You know, you're thinking, what is that? Why are they taking people up there and getting in that baptistry and dunking them under the water? It just messes up their hair and they gotta bring extra clothes. And why, why do they do such a thing? You probably don't even understand. Let me tell you this, we baptize for several reasons. First of all, we baptize because Jesus was baptized. I mean, that's he, we wanna follow his example, we wanna follow in his steps, Jesus was baptized, and so that's part of why we baptize. He also had, uh, as we read in the New Testament, uh, you know, he taught baptism. I mean, as you read it, you can't uh, miss the fact that Jesus talked about it, and we're gonna turn over to Matthew chapter 28, and so I wanna invite you to turn in your Bibles or flip over there on your iPhone or electronic device or Droid, whatever, and uh, we're going to read Matthew chapter 28 in just a minute. Um, another reason that we baptize is uh, we see that people throughout the New Testament who put their faith in Christ, they also were baptized. So that's another reason we do it. And then the biggest reason, I think the most important reason of all for us to do it, is we do it because Jesus told us to do it. 
I mean, his parting words to the disciples have a commandment for us to go out and baptize people and make disciples. We're going to read in Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 19 and 20. This is the Great Commission, Jesus' parting words to his disciples before he ascended to the Father. And in Matthew 28, 19, it says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. How? He says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. Jesus commanded us to do what we're going to do today. That's why we do it. And uh, it's been happening for centuries. And I would tell you today that if you just want to jot down a definition so that you can understand what's this baptism thing all about, just in the simplest terms, I would say to you that baptism is a public declaration of a new association. Baptism is a public declaration of a new association. I have aligned myself with Christ. It is a demonstration of a heart commitment. And there are all kinds of different methods of baptism. Some people baptize with sprinkling, some through pouring, some through immersion. Uh, we believe immersion is the best decision because it best represents our death to the old life and the old self and the burial and the resurrection to new life in Christ. That's why we do immersion. We believe it's important. Baptism represents the washing away, and that is illustrated so greatly in immersion. It represents the washing away of, a, of an old association, the washing away of an old identity, the washing away of an old way of life. You're, you're putting away the things of the past, and you're realizing that in Christ all things become new. And so baptism represents that uh, washing away. And, and just as we go under the water, it is all being washed away. That's why water baptism is so important. As we're resurrected up out of the water, as we're brought out of the water, we are then resurrected to new life in Christ, and it is a coming to life symbolically identifying with a new association, that association, of course, being with Jesus, a new identity and a new way of life. And so in baptism, we publicly identify with the person and the teachings of Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, and this is true with a lot of different issues when it comes to the Christian faith, baptism has been loaded down with a lot of baggage, not from the scripture, but from people and from the church and uh, probably a lot of well-intentioned folks along the way. Some have taught things like, well, you're not saved unless you're baptized. We don't believe that that's what the Bible teaches. Others indicate you have to be baptized in their church in order for it to count. Uh, people get hung up on everything from who does it to where you do it to how you do it to when you do it. And, uh, you know, I'll give you an example of one of the ways people get hung up and there's this baggage with baptism. And that has to do with the issue of infant baptism. Uh, many churches teach and promote infant baptism, and this is a practice that has um, happened down uh, through many years, but I'm going to tell you right now, it has nothing to do with Scripture. You can read it forwards and backwards in the Old Testament and the New. There's no indication that infant baptism is a biblical practice. And uh, you can read it for yourself. It's not in there. And uh, yet, we realize some churches teach infant baptism. Our manual actually makes provision for us to do infant baptism. My question is, who is the authority when it comes to baptism or any other subject? Who is the authority? Is it the church or is it the Bible? Is it the church or is it scripture? We believe that scripture is the foundation. It is the source of truth. It is the, the, uh, the authority on truth. It is the, the authority on baptism and any other subject. And so uh, we go to the word of God to see what it has to say. And I would tell you that most who advocate infant baptism have concluded that infants uh, that are unbaptized go to hell because of original sin. Now, here's the problem with that. We believe in original sin. Original sin meaning that Adam and Eve, the fall in the Garden of Eden, they, they were, uh, you know, doing their thing and, and they committed the, the sin there in the Garden and that's representative of the fall of man and because of that, we've been born into a fallen race, fallen human nature. That all started back there in the very beginning. And, uh, you know, so we believe in that and, uh, but we also believe in God's prevenient grace. And because we serve a gracious and a merciful God, we cannot come to the place where we believe that an infant is condemned to hell before that infant has ever learned to speak. I have a hard time with that according to the, the totality of Scripture. My question is, if an unbaptized baby was condemned to hell, then why would Jesus say, unless you become like a little child and come unto me, 
You know, you're never going to make it. He's the one that said, you, you've got to become like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. And so uh, I, I realize that that may be treading on thin ice for some, and it may make you uncomfortable. And again, again, just want to point you back to the Word of God. Say, hey, if it's in there, show me. I can't find it. I, I would look for that and, and say, hey, it's not there. And I want to be clear on this, especially to those of you that were baptized as a baby. You were raised in a tradition maybe that was baptizing infants. Hear what I've got to say here. To be immersed like we're going to do in this service as an adult it is not a slap in the face to your upbringing or to your religious heritage. Uh, you can be thankful for your past. I mean, if your parents had you baptized as an infant, I say praise the Lord, because what that represented was they had a desire that you would know God. They wanted you to have a relationship with him. They wanted you to know him. That's what it was all about. Be thankful for that. But uh, you also need to realize that baptism, the way it's explained in the Bible, was always a personal and an individual decision. And I would encourage you to jot that down. It is always a personal and an individual decision. It's not something I can choose for somebody else. It's not something that somebody can choose for me. And um, I, um, I say this kindly, but firmly, and I believe biblically, biblically. Infant baptism did not originate from the Bible with Jesus or the example of the apostles. It's not in there. That's why we dedicate babies around here. Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple to dedicate him to the Lord. That's the example we choose to follow. And infant dedication is more of a parental ded dedication anyway. The baby's not making any part in that. The parents are saying, hey, I'm going to choose to raise this child to know and follow Christ. And, and those of you that have a brand new baby, I would tell you, we love to dedicate babies around here where mom and dad say, hey, we're going to choose to follow Christ. We're going to put Christ first in our home. We're going to point this child to Christ. We're going to bring him to the church. We're going to teach him the word of God. We're going to introduce him to Jesus as soon as he or she is old enough to understand that, that uh, you know, they need a savior. That's what we do in dedication. And uh, the, the unfortunate thing, and I've seen this happen many, many times in talking to different people that were baptized as infants, it leads to a false security when it comes to your eternal salvation. I'll talk to somebody and say, well, how do you know that you're going to spend eternity in heaven? Or I'll ask somebody, how, you know, where do you think you're going to spend eternity in heaven? Or, or where do you think you're going to spend eternity? And they'll say, well, I hope heaven. Well, why do you hope heaven? Well, you know, I was baptized as a baby. I'm an American. I'm this, I'm that. I do a lot of good things. I keep the Ten Commandments. They go through all these kind of crazy things, and that's what people are banking on for their eternal destiny. And they have some level of security, at least they think, but it's a false security according to the Word of God. And so I want to encourage you to base your decisions on what the Bible has to say, not what I have to say or the Church of the Nazarene or any other denomination or group or whatever the case may be, um, because uh, we've got to see what the, what the Bible has to say. But, you know, if a person comes to the place from a, you know, scriptural standpoint that they can understand that infant baptism, basing your security or of your salvation on that, it's a false security, then they can begin to process things on a little different manner. And if you get upset on that or have questions about that, I would encourage you to get a copy of this message, take it to whoever it is that taught you that, and ask them to see if they can respond to it from a biblical, and that's the key, from a biblical perspective, not from a denominational perspective or a local church perspective, but what does the Bible have to say? Because here's the key. The Bible is our authority, not the church. I say that right here. Now, that is not to diminish the importance of the church at all. I believe in the church. I love the church. I've given uh, my life to the church. But we have to keep things in perspective. The church is not the authority. The Bible, the Word of God, that is our authority. That's why we encourage you to carry it with you. That's why we encourage you to read it, memorize it, meditate on it, allow it to become a part of the fabric of your life because we hold this book in high esteem and it speaks truth and the truth that we all need to hear if we are open to hear what it has to say. And uh, I tell you that baptism is biblical. Baptism is biblical. You don't have to read very far in the New Testament to see just how biblical and how important it is. Three of the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, three of the four give a very detailed assessment, a detailed um, uh, description of the baptism of Jesus Christ. 
And uh, probably a lot of you are familiar with that. I want to invite you to turn over to Matthew chapter 3. Uh, and we're going to see that not only uh, here's one of the gospel accounts, the very first gospel, Matthew, he's going to give a detailed description of what happened. But not only that, this is big, the very first words that Jesus spoke in the Bible are about baptism. Uh, as the Son of God is being baptized, the Holy Spirit's descending, and the Father is speaking. And if you have a red letter edition of the Bible, which means when you go to the New Testament, you can see that the words Jesus Jesus spoke are written there in red. The very first red letters in the entire New Testament are in the book of Matthew, the third chapter. We're going to read it here beginning at verse 13. It says, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you and you have come to baptize me, question mark. Well, Jesus replied, and here's the first red letters in your New Testament, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, what? Baptism. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open and he saw the Spirit of God descending uh, on him like a dove. And um, <clears throat> the voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. When Jesus was baptized, heaven and earth came together, and after Jesus was baptized, John tells us he began to command his followers to be baptized as well. We see that in the New Testament. And then following the resurrection, just before Jesus ascended to the Father, he gave the, his followers a mission statement. And, you know, we don't get a vote on our mission statement. We can sit around and churches can dissect it and talk about it and have meetings about it and interact about it all they want to. When it comes right down to it, we don't really even get to discuss it because Jesus gave us our mission statement. I mean, we're to make a mature disciples. That's what we're about. The whole foundation of that's on the great commission that we read just a few moments ago from Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. I would tell you that it would be difficult to imagine how you could obey Christ's teaching if you have not been baptized. And I want to say that again because I'm in competition right here with somebody saying, I want you to get this message. If you have not been baptized, if you're in a service just like this, and you're, you're sitting there thinking, you know what? Um, you know, I, I haven't been baptized. I'm not going to be. It would be difficult to imagine how you can obey Christ's teaching if you have not been baptized. Now, I say that lovingly. I'm not trying to condemn. I'm not trying to point fingers. I'm not trying to put down anybody. I'm not trying to judge you. But I'm saying Jesus is basically saying to us, do what I have done. Teach what I have taught. This is how you make disciples. And so I'm telling you, baptism is not a debate. It is not a discussion. It is a decision that quickly becomes a matter of lordship and obedience. And, uh, you know, baptism, I tell people all the time when we have classes, we talk about baptism being the first step of obedience and what we hope will be a lifetime of obedience. Uh, I'm convinced that there is a joy that awaits you from being baptized that you will experience in no other way. And some of you have heard me tell the story about a lady that I think, I'm guessing, but I'm pretty sure she was 84 years old in Kearney, Nebraska. She had never been baptized. She was scared to death of the water. She finally consented to be baptized. And when she did, her daughter testified to me later. She said, I have seen a change in my mother that I cannot even explain. She said, it is as if there has been something holding her back spiritually. She knew she needed to be baptized. She was afraid she wouldn't do it. She finally said, yes, she did it. And now look what God has done. I'm telling you, there is a joy that awaits you from being obedient that you will not experience in any other way. And so I want to make it clear to you today that um, baptism is not the divine option. It really is the divine imperative. Uh, baptism is a command of Jesus. The New Testament disciples, they knew that. Baptism became the pattern of the New Testament church. On one occasion, over in Acts chapter 2, it talks about the fact that, you know, about 3,000 people were added to their number that particular day, and they were baptized. That became the pattern of the book of the Acts. And I would think it's fair to say that the biblical assumption would be that every believer would be baptized. 
And so baptism, again, is for individuals who have personally made a decision to associate with Jesus Christ, to identify with him, to publicly declare their allegiance to him. It is for anybody that's old enough to make a personal decision to associate publicly with Christ. And in baptism, you are basically going on record and saying, I am identifying with Jesus, I am aligning with Jesus, and you have identified yourself with Christ. You're not embarrassed to be associated with him. And if you're wanting to say, well, Steve, really, in truly, if you just cut right through the chase, who should be baptized today? I would tell you that everyone with a capital E-V-E-R-Y-O-N-E, everyone who repents of their sin and confesses faith in Jesus Christ, I believe everyone in that group should be baptized. Now, Jesus, John the Baptist, the disciples, they were baptized. Now you say, no, wait just a minute. Jesus, John the Baptist, the, the disciples, really. You know, there's, I'll be honest with you, there's some in-between-the-lines reading in the Bible. Now, you, I, I would not preach it as gospel because I don't know it to be true, but I would find it very difficult to believe that Jesus would model baptism and then allow the disciples not to be baptized. I find it difficult and hard to believe that the disciples are out there baptizing at the Lord's instruction and they themselves haven't been baptized. That would seem a little bit hypocritical to me. So even though it doesn't say, yes, they were baptized, I believe it's fair to say, yes, Jesus and John the Baptist for sure, and many of the disciples, if not, all of them were baptized. And uh, they were not baptized so they could go to heaven. Their baptism was a public declaration of their faith in Jesus Christ. And so when it comes to being baptized, I hear people all the time say, man, I'm scared of the water. I've never been taught about baptism. I don't want to ruffle feathers within my family. Um, you know, there are some that haven't made Jesus Christ the Lord of their life, and that's why they're not baptized. And I'm going to tell you right now, the only reason, the only reason that should keep you from being baptized is that you are not ready to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Your life. If you've made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, I encourage you to be baptized. That right there on the screen, though, is the only valid reason not to be baptized as far as I'm concerned and as far as what I understand Scripture to say. And so if you've not done so already, I would invite you to make Christ the Lord of your life. And you may sit in a service like this and say, hey, I just wandered in off the interstate. I wasn't planning on getting into this today. I wasn't thinking about my eternal destiny. Or I've been coming to church here for a while and I like the music, but I, I really wasn't planning on getting into anything heavy. I want to tell you that we want to confront you with the gospel of Christ in a loving and redemptive way and say Jesus Christ is the source of salvation. There's one way to heaven and one way only, and we believe that it's through Christ. The word of God says in John chapter 14, verse 6, the words of Jesus himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. He is the gate. He is the door. He is the path, the entrance into heaven. And so you need to have a relationship with him. And my question is, have you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? Have you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? And some of you would say, well, you know, I've been sitting around here for a long time. I've been coming to church here for months. I've been coming for years. Maybe I've been in the church for many years. I, I don't care how long you've gone to church. I don't care if you've gone since you were a child. I don't care if you just showed up for the first time. I, I don't care if you've been on the board or a Sunday school teacher or what you've done in the past. My question is, have you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? And if you haven't, are you ready to do that today? Because that's really where the rubber meets the road. Jesus Christ becoming the Lord of my life. Not that I say, hey, I attended church on Sunday, I got my religious check mark, or I went ever since I was a kid, but I could truly stand up and say, I can identify with Christ because the one who died for me is my Savior. I have repented of my sins. I've asked him to forgive me and come into my heart as my Lord and Savior. I don't care if you're 12 years old or, or 50 years old or 90 years old or anybody in between or before that or after that, when you understand that the word of God is true and that we are all sinners in need of a Savior, that the Bible said we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and that we need to find uh, you know, a, a way to restore that relationship that is severed by sin. And that doesn't mean we just go on sinning, but we, we say, Lord, begin your work in me. Today, as much as I know, I commit it to you and I'm gonna start the process of living the life you've called me to live. And as we've talked these last few weeks in this masquerade series, God begins to pull back the veil and pe kind of peeling off the layers of the onion and you begin to work on things and, because the whole objective of this is he wants us to be like Jesus. That's the whole process. Jesus is the prototype. He's the one that, you know, we're, he, we're modeling our life after. And we want to be like him. But, but I want you to prayerfully consider, and I know that you know the answer. I mean, if you'll really stop and let the Holy Spirit speak to you today, 
you know the answer. Is Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? You may say, well, you know, he's uh, one of many interests. He's one of uh, a few considerations. I'm thinking about it, but you've never really driven a stake. Today could be your day. And I'm going to tell you right now, Satan is cunning. He is deceptive. He is a liar. He is a thief. He came to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to take away from you everything he can, including the gift of eternal life. He, he's not going to tell you lies like there's no heaven because you're smarter than that. You believe there is. You've, you've heard about it, and you, you really deep into your heart because there's something de down deep within you that just, it identifies. I know there's something out there. There is life beyond the grave. Uh, Satan's not going to tell you there's no hell. You're smarter than that. I think you're the kind of people that say, you know what, I, I'm not buying that lie. You know, Satan's not going to say there's no heaven, there's no hell, but he is going to tell you there's no hurry. You can fool around here and, and wait, and, and you could be in a number of people just like were there last night. What a tragedy, and I don't want to make light of that at all, but it points to the fact what happened on the Indiana State Fairgrounds yesterday. You have no assurance about what's going to happen to you 60 minutes from now, let alone 60 seconds from now. An aneurysm, and you blow a gasket, and you're down, and it's over. You have a massive heart attack, it's over. You get in a car accident, it happens all of the time. Buried a 20-some-year-old kid just the other day that was in a motorcycle accident over here on 135, just south of Nashville. Friends of our kids. It happens all the time. He's going to tell you, though, hey, no hurry. You got plenty of time. Well, just hold out. Hold steady. Don't worry about it. I'm telling you today that there is a hurry because today is the day of salvation. That's what the Bible says. They tell us that Jesus walked about 60 miles to be immersed. I'm challenging some of you to walk a few steps and come up on this platform and do it today because uh, what we're going to do is we're going to make it easy for you. We're going to sing a song in just a couple of seconds, and when we do, um, I'm going to say back in room 109, I just felt like that there are going to be some people in a service like this that need to come and be baptized that didn't come planning to do it. Back in room 109, just right outside and to the right, the ushers can direct you. There are robes, baptismal robes, and there are towels. You can go in the bathroom, change. You can come right down the outside. You don't even have to walk through the sanctuary. Right outside this door, if it is raining, you're getting sprinkled, and then you'll come in and be immersed. It doesn't matter. <laughs> You can get, them, get both, and we'll even pour some on you before it's all over. But you come down that side, go to the second door. It's unlocked. The first door will be locked. It's that one. The second door is in that room. You come in there after this first song. We've got several that are prepared to be baptized. We will include you in this baptism in just a few moments because um, we believe that God is going to speak to some of you. And so the question is, does God want you, does God want me to be baptized today? Well, the question is, are you ready to follow the example of Christ and the teaching that he gave us in the New Testament? Uh, would you like to make a public declaration of your faith, of your association with Christ today? Uh, would you like to take a step of obedience? Are you ready to accept Christ maybe for the very first time? Or are you ready to recommit your life to Christ? Folks, there are two things that can connect you with every other Christian in the country and around the world and every Christian who ever lived for the last 2,000 years, and that is communion and baptism. There's a connection with every other Christian from all over the world, world, whatever denomination. It doesn't matter if they were baptized in a spring or a pool or a pond or a puddle or a baptistry. It doesn't matter. It connects you. And there's something amazing that happens in that water baptism as we step out and obey God in this very important and critical area. And I, I hope God has helped you to see why it's such a big deal because you don't want to miss out on that. You don't want your kids to miss out on that. And the truth of the matter is, some of you came here today and you've got things to do later and whatever, but some of you need to do it today. And you've got a knot in your throat and your, your pulse is racing and your palms are sweating. You're like, Lord, really? Really? Today? Really, he's calling you to step out and make him the Lord of your life. And uh, others, you may need to, you know, make a contact or two this week, get with some family and friends and, and talk about it or pray about it and come and see me and we'll get you scheduled. But some of you just need to do it today because if you wait and say, hey, I'm going to talk to some people and I want somebody to be here that's not here, hey, we'll get you a DVD. You can give them a DVD. We got you covered. Do whatever it is the Lord has spoken to you about. I've been praying that you will have the courage to follow through on what you know the Lord is saying to you today. Would you bow with me as we pray? Father, I pray that you would give every person in this room wisdom to 
know what to do with what they've heard. I believe you have spoken and are speaking. And so I pray as your spirit moves up and down the aisles of this church that men and women and teenagers and even boys and girls who understand what it means to be in need of a Savior, what it means to realize that it was my sin that put him on the cross, to realize that the blood price has to be paid for our sin and that we truly do need a Savior. I, I pray that there would be some that would just say, today, Lord, I hoist the white flag and say, I surrender. I'm not going to fight you anymore. I want a relationship. I want to respond to this love that you have shown to me, this unconditional love that I've found no place else. I have decided today is a new day. And so I want to publicly identify. I want to connect. I want to make you the Lord of my life. I want to, I want to go on record so that people will know that Jesus Christ is my Lord. And so, Father, if you're speaking especially to some that are seated here in this sanctuary that hadn't really intended to do it, I know they're sitting there thinking, now, what did he say? I really don't know. I'm not exactly sure. Just help them to do a very simple thing, to get up and go get a robe, get a towel and change clothes and come down the side of the building and walk in and, when it's time, step into that water and break that old association, break that old identity, break that old lifestyle and die out to self and obey you and be resurrected to a new identity, a new association, a new lifestyle. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.